Of church, amen. And, uh, it is a blessing to be here this morning. God is truly good, truly wonderful. Better to ourselves, better to us than we've been to ourselves. Amen. Amen. It is always a privilege to be standing before you to present the word of God. I will not belabor the hour. Yesterday we had a good event. Amen. We had a great clothing drive. We were able to serve many people. Uh, many clothes were dispersed. Amen. Um, and just just thankful to God for just some of the connections that we we made in that time period. Just connecting with folk. Amen. To let them know that we're here to fulfill the ministry of Christ. Amen. Uh, Matthew 25. I said yesterday after the event, I said we, we ought to call it a, the, the 2535 ministry. Amen. Matthew 25, 35 and verse 36. It says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was a stranger, you visited me, invited me in. And when I was sick, you visited me. It is a blessing to serve the master in that capacity. Amen. Amen. I will say, I will say, one of the things that, that, that such events will do is it will help put grace, the grace of God, in proper perspective. Amen. Because there was a time when we were without. Amen. And the fact that God blesses us now and we can bless someone else, Lord, it just keeps things in perspective. Amen. 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 Let us continue to keep uh, those who are absent, Sister Lily was not feeling well, if I understand correctly, this morning. Keep her in prayer. I believe she wasn't feeling well uh, since Wednesday. Um, so please keep her in prayer, uh, as well as uh, Brother Maurice. Brother Maurice, he actually had reached the completion of his uh, entry. Uh, Lord, have mercy. You go to a job. You there for a probationary period? That's it. He, he's he's in the, the probationary period that he has at his job, and now he's able to select a shift. Um, and that happened last week, and this week they kept him. So I think what's happening is he's able to uh, uh, select a shift. But keep him in prayer that God see uh, be favorable to him, as well as Sister Kathy. Um, her sister Kathy, um, her um, mother and father as well. Um, her father uh, is a difficult case right now. Um, He's having trouble just going from the bath, from the bedroom to the bathroom, so keep him in prayer. I know some of us received that text message as well. Our prayers are with those uh, victims of the earthquake in Italy. Uh, just a rough situation that took place and took several lives. Our prayers are also with the families of the two-year-old uh, and the eight-year-old here in Camden. Uh, that, 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 that just a tragic situation. And our prayers are with their families during this time. It is not easy. Um, we ought to be praying for such people. Amen. 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 Thankful to the brothers who led us in our uh, worship thus far. Uh, Brother John, masterful job leading us in song service, leading us in praising the Lord. Amen. 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 Again, I will not be before you long. Uh, well, I say that. I will be here until I'm finished. Listen, now for the word of God. This morning we continue our series of understanding the gospel message written in Luke chapter 7. If you have your Bibles, please turn, uh, or you should have already had it marked, um, Luke chapter 7 verses 24 through 30. Luke chapter 7 verses 24 through 30. Amen. Good to see everybody here with us. I have an announcement to make. Some people don't believe me. They didn't believe me on Facebook. My son said his first word yesterday. Uh-huh. Looked Dominique right in the face and was like, hi. That's a word. That's a word. That's a word. Uh-huh. 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 He ain't said it since then. But he said his first word. Anyway, but, uh, but uh, that's just as I look at them together right now. But Luke chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. I'll just reread for emphasis sake. The Bible says, when the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you. And one who is more than a prophet... This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I, will, I send my messenger ahead of you 
who will prepare your way before you. And I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet he who is the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John the baptizer. Have you ever heard the phrase, you talking loud, but you ain't saying nothing? Comes from a James Brown song of the same name, talking loud, saying nothing. In our society, everybody wants to be heard and says that they have a message that they want to share with people. There are a lot of people, politicians, even preachers and musicians today, that have a platform, but they're simply talking loud and saying nothing. In the 80s and 90s, y'all know where I'm coming from, groups like Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, NWA, Public Enemy, Rage Against the Machine, were all groups that could turn a party out. Uh huh. But just like James Brown, Ray Charles, and Marvin Gaye, they had songs that made you think of a background music that would creep into your mind. Musicians had to sell records, but the point of doing music like that was that you enjoyed the music, but you would not miss the message. This morning, here in our scripture reading, we see that Jesus is discussing John the baptizer and why people went out to see him. It is here in the text that Jesus breaks down and asks the question, you went out to hear a prophet, but did you get the message? If you would lend me your heart and ears to this thought, don't miss the message. Don't miss the message. Before our scripture reading, we see Jesus has a few interactions with those that surround him and those that he moved around. Immediately after he finishes his sermon on the mount, we see in verses 1 through 10 that we examined three weeks ago, we see that Jesus comes into contact with the centurion who approaches Jesus with real, genuine faith in Jesus' real, genuine authority. In verses 11 through 17, we see Jesus coming into contact with two of John the Baptizer's disciples, questioning if he is genuinely the Messiah. And he proves himself to be the Messiah by showing that he is exactly in what he does and says consistent with what the scripture denoted. It is at this point, building upon the previous verses and interaction with John's disciples that we examined last week that we find ourselves. John the baptizer, this is written the Baptist in many translations, but all that means is the baptizer because that's what he did. But John the baptizer's disciples are heading back to John to share all that they have seen Jesus do. It's at this point that Jesus begins to question the crowd that surrounds him. Referencing John by saying, what did you go into the wilderness to see? Was it a tall reed? blowing in any direction of the wind. Perhaps hmm, there were people that expected to see a crazy person. He goes further. Was it a man dressed in beautiful clothes like royalty? Perhaps there were people expecting to see a nobleman. And then finally he says, was it a prophet that you went out to see? Jesus, the way Jesus explains it, it seems the people went out to see John in the wilderness for a reason. They went to see a prophet. But some may have had an opinion in mind. They may have thought that he was like a reed shaken. You know a reed is blown any direction the wind goes. So they wanted to see if he was crazy. You might have had people to see if he was in soft clothing. Or if he was a nobleman. Or if he was royalty. But regardless of the reason. They went out to see a prophet. Jesus then explains that John the Baptist was more than a prophet. He was the messenger. Verse 27, where Jesus says, this is, who, this is the one 
about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who, who will prepare your way before you. It is written is a statement that Jesus has stated many times in the gospel accounts. In his temptation in Matthew chapter 4 with Satan, he's tempted three separate times and each time he replies, it is written. To grasp the depth of what Jesus was saying, however, we have to go to the Old Testament passages of scripture that Jesus references when he says in this verse, it is written. Jesus, when he says, this is the one about whom it is written, is referencing two passages of scripture, one in part, short form, and one uh, whole or in its complete form. He quotes in part Isaiah 40 and verse 3. And in that, excuse me, in that passage, God the Father is speaking to God the Son and God is also speaking to his messenger. We see the narrative play out in chapters 40 through 44 but he says in Isaiah 40 and verse 3 a voice is calling clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. This scripture speaks to John the Baptist's task and where John would be located the wilderness. He quotes in whole, however, Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 1. But before we get there, we got to talk about some stuff. In Malachi, God shares via his prophet Malachi his judgment of the people. They had become corrupt and wicked, having a false sense of security in their relationship with God. People were paying God more lip service than anything else. There was no sincerity. Amen. Now the scripture that Jesus quotes Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1 is actually the answer to a question. The question is actually found in the last verse of Malachi chapter 2, that's verse 17. When we put the two verses together, it becomes clear what the Father was stating in the Old Testament and what the Son is stating about John in Luke chapter 7. So if you would, would you turn over to Malachi chapter 3? If you get to Matthew, go left one book. As a matter of fact, if you get to Matthew chapter 1, and you have no introduction before Matthew, turn over one page and you're in chapter 3. But we're going to go to chapter 17, the last verse, verse 17, and look right through. Break down real quick. Uh, uh, verses and chapters were put into the Bible for easy reference and for study, but that's not how they originally came. Make sense? So we got to look at the thing holistically as to what is written. The Bible says... Malachi chapter 2 verse 17 all the way through chapter 3 and verse 1 is just two verses you have wearied the Lord with your words yet you say how have we wearied him in that you say everyone who does evil in the sight of the Lord everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord and he delights in them or where is the God of justice? So the answer comes in verse 1 of chapter 3. Behold, I'm going to send my messenger. And he will clear the way before me. This is Christ now. God the Son. Speaking through his prophet. Behold, I'm going to send my messenger. And he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple his body and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight behold he is coming says the Lord of hosts uh huh it points out how the people have wearied the Lord they say doing evil is good in God's sight ain't that something that seems like the same thing that's happening today amen well side note uh, it, it, one of the things we hear consistently, frequently, over time, it's okay. Or expected that a man will cheat or a woman will cheat in their relationship. Hmm. It's okay to be drunk. It's okay to be high. It's okay to be a thought. It's okay to be a player. Because God is all about love. And he loves you and loves for you to do whatever you want. The, the, the foolishness of today. This, uh, that, that's just talking about what's happening today. Amen. It's very similar to what took place back then. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Amen. 
Repeating verse 17 very quickly, it says, You've wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, How have we done so? In that you say, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them, or where is God's justice? Thus, God has to give the answer, saying, I'm going to send my messenger to clear or to prepare the way before the sun. That's my signal that my answer is coming. So the messenger brings a message. Well, let's go a little bit further. After he says this, God goes silent. If you have a Bible and you get to the end of chapter 3 or chapter 4 in Malachi, if you turn over one page, that's Matthew, right? Right? Malachi is the end of the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, what they call the Hebrew Bible. Matthew is the beginning of the New Testament that we have, right? What you don't know is that God says, I'm going to send my messenger to signal when I sent my son. But there's a space between Matthew and Malachi. Even if you have the deuterocanonical uh, apocrypha of the Old Testament, it always ends in Malachi. There's a reason it stops in Malachi and picks right back up in Matthew. The space between Malachi and Matthew in your Bible is actually 400 years of silence. For 400 years, God didn't send a prophet to, Israel, to the people of Israel. For 400 years, the people of Israel were waiting for the Messiah. For 400 years, they were waiting for a word from the Lord. For 400 years. So with that, I got to segue real quick, and then the lesson will be yours. If we segue for a moment, we have to talk about royalty. All right, we can do that real quick. Let's talk about kings and royalty. You see, in royalty, anytime a king was to arrive somewhere there was a messenger that always went before the king to let everybody know that the king was about to show up the messenger was also known as a crier it's remarkable to know now I had said Isaiah 40 in verse number 3 earlier but in the King James Version I love how it puts it because it says the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness it's recognizing John as Jesus's messenger Jesus's crier because Jesus is our king amen the crier would always come before the king the crier always signified that the king was on his way sometimes he'd arrive days weeks months years before the king would show up but he showed up to get the people ready preparing the people to receive the king being ready to receive the king in the case of Christ the king was to ready the people to turn towards the Messiah being prepared to follow him and hear the message of Christ. Amen. What we call the gospel. In line with Luke chapter 7, Jesus proved himself to be the king and Messiah that everyone was waiting for. The thing is that people had to agree with God's plan in order to be blessed by it. What do you mean, Ken? The people had to agree with God's plan the people even now in order to be saved you've got to agree you've got to obey God's plan amen as a result the people were immersed baptized in acknowledgement of God's plan and his justice some versions will say they justified God being baptized with the baptism of John John the baptizer's baptism got to point this out was for the purpose of preparing readying the people to turn toward Jesus and his way readying them to obey his blessed will the issue was the people were wicked and so he has to say look 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 don't let him catch you like this have you ever one of the things that I distinctly remember, uh, that I remember doing, and I remember, uh, what, you know, your mama leave, and she tell you do something, and you forget to do it, or rather you don't do it, and then she put the key in the lock, and you could hear it cut the click, 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 as the key goes in the lock, and all of a sudden you scrambling to get everything done, it couldn't happen. God was gracious. Lord have mercy. God is gracious. God is gracious. Lord, we could sit right here for a minute. We ain't got time. Well, we actually do. But we're, Lord. He sends the messenger. When my, 
when my, my mother would oftentimes talk about my father and me, and she would say, I would tell him, do this, 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 and the other. Nothing in the house is done. And then I would listen as I, put my key in, as I put the key in the door. He wouldn't hear it, but you would. Four years old. And all I hear, mommy's here. And then we all over the house trying to think. She heard something sound like a ruckus. It's the same thing. But God is merciful. He doesn't just send Jesus. He sends the messenger first. Get ready. The baptism will say, look here, do you rec recognize something's wrong? You got to get ready for him. You know what? I need to turn from that. And so they were baptized in John's baptism. A baptism of only repentance, not salvation, for the message of Christ. Well, let's dig a little bit deep in Luke chapter 7. The opposition in our text were the Pharisees, and it says lawyers, but it's the teachers of the law. They rejected God's purpose and plan not being baptized with John's baptism. They rejected God's purpose for themselves. Here it was that God had a plan to save the world. Y'all hear what I said? He had a plan to save the world, and the Pharisees rejected it. The crier came before the king to sig signal to the world that he's coming. The people were preparing themselves with John's baptism for the entrance of the king. And here it was that the Pharisees and teachers of the law missed the message. John the Baptist's message was that the Messiah was on his way. But we, could, we need to look at it from another perspective. You see... It wasn't just that the Messiah was on its way. It's that the Messiah was the message of the messenger. Did you hear me? The Messiah was the message of the messenger. Christ is the message of the messenger. Amen? Christ respected John and knew who John was in the scheme of God's plan for the world. John the Baptist was the part of God's plan to introduce Christ here on earth. Because John fulfilled his role, it allowed Jesus to fulfill his role. Amen? Both roles in accordance with the scripture. The question that needs to be asked today as we deal with the gospel, have you acknowledged the Messiah in obedience? Or do you reject them also like the Pharisees? I say it again. Have you acknowledged the Messiah in obedience or do you reject them also like the Pharisees in our scripture? John baptized for the purpose of getting people in line or turning to face and expect the Messiah, the King. But as said in verse 28, I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet he who is the least in the kingdom of God is greater than him. Being in the kingdom, in the body of Christ, in his church is greater than being uh, how John was. We got family in here, so I just want to holler at y'all for a minute. You have to recognize God's grace. Grace, as we've spoken in time past, is very simply giving you something you don't deserve. In the Old Testament, we see in uh, Genesis chapter 6 that God was displeased by mankind. And one of the things that he says there, he says, listen, my spirit shall not dwell with man long. So he says... The days of man shall be 120 years. Now the issue there is that in certain uh, uh, cases, certain individuals will take that and will say, well, oh, he made sure that man only lived 120 years old, but he had favor with Noah. Noah was 600 years old. That's not what he said. What happened was Noah was building the ark for 120 years. So when God said, my spirit shall only be with man, man shall only live 120 years, he meant, I'm going to give this period of grace. Man was already wicked. Man was already wicked. Man was already wicked. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Already wicked. But he said, I'm going to give you some time before I destroy the earth. If we go, even at the end of Malachi, he says, man is wicked, but I'm going to send my messenger before the Messiah gets there. What's he saying? 
Jesus could have come right there and there. Right at the end of Malachi. He doesn't. Jesus could have come first thing. There would have been no John. But God says, mm -mm, I need somebody to get them ready for when my son shows up. Do you see grace? He says, the messenger, your job is to take this message so that they can get ready. So that when the Messiah comes, they'll just obey him and just stick with him. That's grace. I stand before you as a messenger of God's word. God ain't come back yet. Amen. That's grace and mercy. That's his grace just saying get the message out there. Amen. Church we got a responsibility. Amen. To share the gospel message with everybody that surrounds us. We have a responsibility. Amen. To share that gospel message. We're the messengers. Jesus is the message. We ought to share it with everybody we know. Because right now, when he comes back again, that's it. Game over. Game point. Clock ran out. In and out of innings. It's over. We have a responsibility. Amen. The message of the gospel is Jesus Christ. And what he brings is grace. We're going to talk about it this afternoon a little bit more at 3.30. But God, Lord, God is so gracious. When you go back, you think about all the things that we've done. When I go back in my mind, I think about everything I've done. Has anybody been like me? You think about the things that you've done and it brings tears to your eyes. You think about the things you've done and you just, oh, I wish I never did. You, you ever think about the things that you've done and yet and still this same uh, uh, Messiah came and he just said, I, I got you. If you obey me, if you obey me in baptism, if you obey this gospel, I got you. I'll justify you. Lord, that's just... Lord, sometimes we forget God's grace. We forget his mercy. But that's a reason to get excited. Amen? That's a reason to jump up and shout. That's a re because of God's grace. Lord, have mercy. We're in a society that does not respect life. And we ought to thank God for his grace. Because his grace, the same people, the same idiots, I say it like that, that shot that two-year-old. That same idiot could have just been coming down this here street and coming this building to decide he just won't hurt everybody. But because of God's grace, his mercy, his protection. Lord, that's God's grace. He just, mm-mm, not around my people. Mm-mm. Lord, y'all follow what I'm saying? Amen. Listen, in a moment, we're going to stand. We're going to sing the hymn of invitation. We're going to give you opportunity. Listen, today is family in hand right now. So listen, if today you need prayer, we're going to stand. We're going to pray together. And we're going to give all of our cares to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. And again, I say, listen, if, if what your prayer request is, is too difficult to mention, you don't have to mention it. You just say pray for me because God isn't just gracious. He knows everything. Amen. Knows everything. And that is, Lord have mercy. That just, that just, Lord, that makes you appreciate grace more because he knows the things that we've hidden from everybody around us. He knows the things that, in all honesty, if we don't say it, nobody knows it exists. And he still loves us and still gives us his grace and his mercy. So if you need prayer, we're going to stand and sing right now as we stand and sing the hymn of invitation.